If you would be opening your Bibles to the New Testament and to the little one chapter book of Jude, which we have been studying. None of these studies takes the place of sitting down and studying each word of the book. I might even say that when it comes certainly to our Wednesday night study. Those studies don't take the place of reading every word. In this case, since we're there now, study the book of Romans on Wednesday night. But they do try to lay out and emphasize some of the main points that the writer was making. I know you may think this redundant, but it doesn't hurt to remind us as much as we possibly can, these books were written to Christians. I was thinking in singing the last song. They could have sung that song as well as we. They already knew the sentiments of that song. And though four-part harmony wouldn't be developed for a few hundred years later, they could have certainly sung those sentiments because they were Christians. And all that the Bible defines that term to mean and as it uses it. So up to this point in our study, the inspired Jude has established the need. Underscore that word, need. The need for his readers to contend earnestly for the faith. I'll pause here and say this. To say that I must do that as a part of me being faithful to the best of my ability implies a great many things. First of all, it says you've got to know how to do it. Which means you have to know the faith well enough to do it. Because you have to, from your knowledge of the faith, be able to identify those things contrary to the New Testament system, which is what the faith means here. With reminders of God's righteous condemnation of the ungodly, Jude 5 through 7, and with a vivid depiction or description of the ungodly men who have crept in unnoticed, Jude 9 through 16 and verse 19, we now notice that Jude gives us in the study today a series of exhortations. Now part of preaching the gospel is to exhort the brethren. Exhortation carries with it the firm idea you know these things you know that's part of your responsibility in being faithful to God you don't reject these things intellectually but what you need is to get up and get with it <laughs> that's basically what he's exhorting them to do you can see Paul employ this when he addresses in the second Corinthian epistle those brethren concerning the collection for the poor saints in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Because he uses the Macedonians who came from very poor circumstances economically in various ways. And of course ultimately the great sacrificial life of Christ to save them from their sins as it is for all men. But he uses them by saying, now a year ago you promised to make this contribution. I have used you as an example to them, and they surprised me in what they could give. And the reason they gave beyond their means is because they first gave themselves. Now let me say to you Corinthians, you, what you promised to do a year ago, when those people come by to pick up that contribution, where are you going to be at that time? I don't need to convince you of the rightness of it. I need to convince you of doing it. There is a great amount of teaching to members of the church that ought to be in the area of exhortation. Oh, yes, I know a lot of members of the church as they are in society in general about things we used to could assume people knew that they just simply don't know the truth. They don't study it. But at the same time, for those of us who do know what we ought to do, 
then the question arises, are we doing it? So we need to be exhorted to act upon what we already know. And so Jude now launches into that. And the purpose then, the purpose, I say, of these exhortations is to make sure they stand strong in the faith. Once for all, and actually one time for all time that's been given to the saints. And those verses are 17 through 23. Twice in these verses... Jude addresses the readers as beloved, verse 17 and verse 20. Now, as you read through the scriptures, and I'm thinking specifically of the New Testament letters, this term beloved is used frequently. It is used by Paul as he wrote to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. It's used by the inspired writer to the Hebrews in chapter 6 and verse 9. By the apostle Peter in chapter 2 verse 11 of 1 Peter. And by John the apostle in 1 John 4 verse 1, verse 7, and verse 11. And now we see it's used by Jude in the beginning of of this one little one chapter letter. So clearly, obviously, plainly, the word beloved means that those addressed are very near and dear to the heart of the one who uses it, in this case, the writer Jude. Now I want you to keep that in mind because of what he says and that he is exhorting the brethren to contend earnestly for the faith once for all, once for all time, delivered to the saints. I suggest that when you look at the uses of beloved brethren elsewhere in the New Testament, that that term is used, and yet many times within those letters where it is used to describe the attitude of the writer to those addressed, that he has some pretty strong things sometimes to say to them. And that dispels the idea that if you love me, you won't tell me I'm wrong. You won't remind me of things I'm not doing that I ought to do, that I've been taught I should do, and I know I ought to do it, but I'm derelict in my duty. We've let this, what's called really, romanticist view of love and how it impacts others. Take over, but that's not the view of love that's presented in the New Testament. It's not the view that God has in John chapter 3, verse 16 of his love for the world. You know, the, the verse in John 3, 16, which everybody knows, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, that's the same God, and John calls him God is love. That's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. There are people who follow this false definition of this romanticized, mushy, better felt than told, subjective, sick, syrupy concept of love. They can't reconcile those two. They cannot reconcile Jesus, who says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your soul. Or they can't read Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 13, his great treatise on agape love, where he talks about the works of love, if you please, and still reconcile that with Paul standing Peter in the face because he was to be blamed. Or Paul saying to the Galatian churches, I'm afraid of you. Or God, as I said earlier, pronouncing on the day of judgment, depart from me, I never knew you, into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. They have adopted, and it's become so much a part of their, the fabric of their character, they cannot see how that a God who is love can declare those things to people that he gave his son to save. They just don't understand it. 
And yet here you see Jude inspired of the Holy Spirit writing part of the New Testament of Christ who calls them beloved, but he exhorts them to act upon things in order to be steadfast in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So we find Jude giving these exhortations because they're necessary. <coughs> necessary to keep the brethren from being misled by the ungodly who crept in unawares. They slipped in. They have not been, the faithful that is, been as vigilant as they ought to. They just with open arms grabbed up everybody that came along and smelled good and sounded right and contributed well. Shook their hands and served the best food at the get-togethers. Gets along well with people and so they just said, must be faithful to God. Jude says, that's not the way you measure who's godly and who's not. In fact, Jude says, these fellows could be ungodly. I've thought sometimes that there ought to be, a, just for fun, a recipe. And we all call it Sapphira's recipe. Well, you know that they would have been all involved in the work in Jerusalem. If they had had a covered dish luncheon, put covered dish luncheon in quotes, why, she would have bought some of the best tasting stuff you ever ate in your life, and everybody would have run around grabbing for a recipe. But how did God see them? He saw them as they were, didn't he? As they were. He saw them for what they were. And the only way we can do that is to discern who is what by the fruits they bear as that fruit corresponds with the truth of God's word. So let's examine these exhortations to the beloved. And in so examining them, let's keep in mind that as God's children, we too are beloved, beloved of God, Romans 1 verse 7, Thus these exhortations are therefore directed to us and to all Christians until the end of time. Now considering the first exhortation, we see that they are designed to keep us from stumbling. I saw yesterday, for some who are my age, you'll appreciate this if you didn't already know it, that it's not disease that's necessarily the greatest uh, problem for those 70 and over. Now, I want to give it time for those 70 and over or just under 70 or whatever to think for a minute. Can you guess what it is? It's stumbling and falling flat on your face when you don't think you are. And even when you're younger, sometimes that happens. <laughs> Well, lo and behold, there's a spiritual stumbling, and yet we can do something about it if we will. He says, you remember the words that are spoken before, verses 17 and 18. Remember who spoke those words, and words are vehicles of thought. They are signs of ideas. If I want to know what's on God's mind, I have to read and understand God's word. And he wrote this to Christians to keep us from stumbling. And I ought to want to know what it says, what it means, what that means in my life. Who spoke them? Well, they were the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when the church was established on that first Pentecost day in Acts 2? Luke says of the early church, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. As I've said many, many times, the early church knew how God, through Christ, was revealing His will. They knew it was through the apostles. They knew that they needed to do what the apostles said in the way the apostles said do it and for the reason or reasons the apostles said do it because Christ spoke through his ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth. And today we continue steadfastly the apostles' doctrine also if we want to go to heaven. They were then duly appointed and sent out by Jesus himself. Because he's really at the right hand of God. By the Holy Spirit, they were guaranteed to speak infallibly. 
The early church knew that. And they knew that to heed the apostles' teaching and abide therein was to heed the Lord himself and abide in the Lord. Jesus had made that clear. When before his death he assembled with the apostles to talk about his death and how he would send the Holy Spirit to them and that the Holy Spirit through them would continue doing what Christ had done on earth. John chapter 13 and verse number 20. They were to remember then what they said. And you'll remember too, Peter's an apostle of course, that Peter said there would be mockers in the last time. 2 Peter 3, 1 through 3. Now what was the early church to understand about that? Well, a mocker makes light of serious things. Remember those unbelieving Jews standing around the cross. If he be the Son of God, let him bring himself down by the cross and we'll bleed on him. He saved others, he himself he can't save. He said he would build the temple because they lied here or he would tear the temple down. In three days, he'd raise it up or at least tear it down in three days and I'll raise it up. Of course, he was talking about the resurrection of his body. They rented it out of its context and applied it to the temple in Jerusalem. That's mocking. We have a few of those around today. <laughs> and not a few of them are in the church. We say, I haven't heard of it, but that may be because we don't keep up with business in the church elsewhere as we keep up with our bills we pay each month. Paul told Timothy that such wicked people would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and chapter 4, 3 through 4. Peter, uh, Timothy needed to know this because he needed to be faithful as an individual Christian, but he needed to know it also because he's a preacher and he needed to preach it to the brethren. We must remember what they wrote, and that's what Jude says. There's only one way to remember it, and that's keep studying it. And that reminds us, too, of what we've quoted often from Peter, this second epistle, Beloved, I, what? Beloved? I now write unto you in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Well, that implies you knew it, but you let it slip. You need to call it back to mind, and you need to act on it. Thus, we must be diligent in our study of the Word of God. They need to understand this. I would say one of the greatest things for anybody who's going to serve God is to realize the need of study and prayer, prayer and study, to learn how to study, to learn how to handle right the word of truth, to make it a necessary part of your daily living, and to spend much time in prayer, as the Bible says. Pray without ceasing. It means it's regular in your life. So the need for such study is also made clear in the next exhortation, verse 20, verse 20, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Now, there are doctrines around that purport to be from God concerning how God saves us that says you don't have anything in the world to do to your salvation. Strange here, the Holy Spirit through Jude said as a part of the way Christians are to remain faithful, you have an individual personal responsibility. To what? To build yourself up. Do you remember Peter exhorting the people who were being preached to by he and the other apostles, saying to them, save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation? Well, I thought Christ saved us. How can they save themselves when they do their part? As a free moral agent, you've got to honestly handle the truth preached to you and accept it having proved all things and holding fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Those people on the day of Pentecost, the day the church began, had listened, had understood, and were persuaded by the truth preached that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And they wanted to be saved by Him. So to build up suggests growth and development in one once one's become a Christian. It's not enough just to lay down one level of knowledge and understanding. We must continue 
to build upon it or lose what we had in the first place. Peter expressed it, grow in the grace, favor, and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice how the Holy Spirit links both of them together? Grace means favor. But notice that conjunction and in the knowledge. You can't have proper knowledge of God's Word without having proper understanding of His grace. And you can't have a proper understanding of His grace if you don't understand what's taught about it in the Bible. And yet you can yet have it grow and to develop to learn how Christ thought, how He thinks, and how His spiritual body of which we're individual members in particular are to think. So we therefore need to take advantage of opportunities to study and to learn. And that will destroy the idea, do I have to? To build up yourselves suggests then again personal responsibility. You know one of the greatest evils of any age, but especially our age, is that I don't take personal responsibility for anything. If it's a bad thing, I'm going to find somebody else to blame. And you look at our nation. You look at families. You look at businesses. I don't know why we're not aware of the fact that's going to happen. Well, that's exactly what Adam did when God confronted him about his own sin. He tried to transfer that guilt over to really God. The woman thou gavest me, she did give me and I did eat. Who gave that woman to Adam? God did. So, God, you're at fault. If the woman hadn't been here and you gave her to me, I wouldn't be in this mess. The easiest thing there is, is to pass the book. So while God, godly fam family members, and faithful members of the Lord's church will encourage us and will exhort us and admonish us, reprove us when necessary. Each one of us must accept personal responsibility and put forth what only we can put forth in the way of proper effort to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The most holy faith, as he mentions it here, is that faith for which we are to contend. It's that body of doctrine that created our own personal faith, confidence, and belief in God and godly things. And which sustains us and makes it stronger. It's that body of doctrine which has been revealed as I've said already, one time for all times. It is that faith that pertains to what our Lord Jesus Christ has done, is doing as the mediator and only mediator between God and man, and will do for us as long as we walk this earth. We do that or we depend and can be blessed by these things Depend on and be blessed by them as we walk in the light as He is in the light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. As we abide in the doctrine of Christ. I remind you that the faith is the same as the doctrine. It's the same as the gospel. It's the same as the New Testament system. It's the same as, as James said, the perfect or complete law of liberty, James 1.25. It's simply one word standing for the whole of the teaching of Christ. Now these first two exhortations stress the importance of our continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, as I said, Acts 2.42. And again, obviously, this means that we must study and study diligently and then apply honestly and objectively the Word of God to every facet of our life, our lives, and, of course, our dealings one with another, our dealings with our family members, wherever it is. But 
But Bible study alone will not suffice. There's still the need to. And he says pray in the Holy Spirit. Well, there's just a few things I want to say about that. During this time, there were miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. All nine of them are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The apostles possessed all nine of them, plus one. They could lay hands on a member of the church and impart a certain miraculous gift to them. Why? Because they didn't have a New Testament they could open up and study it. Jews writing part of it right here. Yet they were to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. How did they do it? Proper use of the miraculous gifts. Again, read 1 Corinthians 12. Those gifts, of course, could be abused because they didn't over, overrule the free will of man, and they did abuse them in Corinth, and it took a letter from the Holy Spirit through Paul to correct them and their abuses and misuses of them. But nevertheless, they were there. And what it meant to them in prayer to pray in the Holy Spirit in the miraculous days, I don't know all how that is any more than I know how if I had the miraculous gift of languages, I could just start speaking any language I needed to preach the gospel because God gave me that miraculous power to do it. I don't understand how that works anymore. I understand how a lot of these work when it comes to a miracle, a setting aside of the natural laws, raising somebody from the dead or healing the sick. But I do know this by the Word of God, the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular by the word of God, God speaks to us, God guides us, God leads us. And I know that by prayer, we speak to God. I know that Jesus even left a model prayer. And we have further instruction on prayer throughout the rest of the New Testament. The word of God is a source of strength and comfort to us. But we also have Paul mentioning that prayer too is strength and comfort to us. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Prayer and the Word of God, I think of it as this, are two columns on which our spiritual well-being stands. Both need to be employed routinely and regularly in our spiritual growth. But now what is meant by praying in the Spirit when I read this today. Well, Jude doesn't elaborate on it much, and that may say they understood it very well, what it was to pray in the Spirit, and he didn't consider that need to be elaborated on. Paul doesn't either. And he uses that expression to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 6.18. But Paul does use the expression also of walk, in the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 25. Walk in the Spirit. And if that doesn't suggest walking or living according to the Spirit's direction as found in the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, I don't know what it means. And I do know that to pray according to the Spirit means I pray according to the teaching of the Spirit through the inspired writers as laid out in the authority, the authoritative Word of Christ. And I think it makes good hermeneutical sense. By hermeneutics, I mean the science of rightly dividing the truth, the Word of Truth. To understand that the expression praying in the Spirit, for us today at least, means to emphasize that our prayers are to be in harmony with what the Holy Spirit through the inspired writers wrote in the Word of God. And you know, that's akin to what the Apostle John had to say in 1 John 5 verse 4. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything, listen, according to His will, He heareth us. Now where are you going to find what's according to the will of God, except 
in the right and the body of the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, the instrument the Spirit uses to convict men of sin and to convert them to Christ and to keep us faithful. And who inspired Jude to write this letter for that very point? Next, we see Jude exhort the brethren to keep yourselves in the love of God. That's interesting. That's a responsibility that we have that nobody else has. Verse 21. Verse 21. Part of my life has to do with helping you go to heaven. Part of your life has helping me go to heaven. And the way the Bible teaches that is done. But there is that part of my life that only I can do. So we see the need of personal responsibility laid out again. We're called upon to keep yourselves. And the word for keep is the same word that is used or translated preserved in verse 1. So while we are indeed preserved, where? In Jesus Christ. We must understand that preservation takes place with our cooperation and our cooperation is to obey Christ. To obey what he said. To do as he teaches. Peter wrote, we are kept by the power of God through faith. 1 Peter 1.5 But faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10.17 And Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5.7 but since faith comes by hearing the word of God, and we're to walk by faith and not by sight, it must be that to walk by faith and not by sight is to walk as the word of God authorizes us to walk. Colossians 3.17. The power of God is the divine contribution, God's part, the divine sign of keeping us safe. Remaining faithful is the human contribution to keep us safe. It's not a one-sided affair. It's not all God or it's not all man. To me, just to contemplate the fact we're made as free moral agents, the power to choose or reject, to be honest or dishonest, to know when we've been dishonest and need to repent, all that implies that while God may want me to be in heaven with him, and lo and behold, he says he does. He's not willing that any should perish, but notice then my responsibility but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. If it was left up to God, no one would be lost. But once he made us free moral agents, the power to intellectually consider and act upon what we learn, that put us in a position then as to really cast the deciding vote because the devil's cast one against us. God's cast one for us. And we cast the deciding vote is which way we're going to go. Keeping ourselves in God's love. Jesus taught so much about keeping the commandments of God. It's how we are to be beneficiaries of the love of God. John 14, 21 and 23. It's how we will love. We will be loved by the Son. John 15, 9 through 10. Observing the commandments of Christ are essential if salvation is to be ours and we're to enjoy the love of God. Keeping the commandments of God is all that really matters, according to the Apostle Paul. And he says as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. It's also the ultimate proof that we love God and His children. John put it this way in John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. By this, we know that we love the children of God. If you ask yourself a question, do I love old brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so as a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ? Do I love them like the New Testament says I ought to? Well, John, by the Spirit, is saying, by this, we know that we love the children of God. Now watch what it is. It's not hard. When we love God, well, how do I know I love God? Same way I know I love you and you love me is brethren and keep his commandments. That's the reason I know that Paul loved Peter when he was studying the face because he was to be blamed because Peter played the hypocrite. 
Because Paul was keeping the commandments of God as pertained to Peter's sin when he dealt with him. So you see, we can let things change us as to what we say. Oh, Lord, why did I do this? Leave that alone. Why did that have to be said? I just see some women standing off over in the corner watching what happened between Paul and it wouldn't necessarily just be women, but sometimes it is. Wringing their hands saying, now why did Paul have to do that? Couldn't he just left well enough alone? It all smoothed itself out. Well, when you read what God preserved for us, does it not teach us anything about our responsibilities to the truth? Then look for the mercy of our Lord, verse 21. By the way, before we leave 1 John 5, 22 and 3, he says when we love God and keep his commandments, and then he says, for this is the love of God. I preach this many times said, you want to see the love of God? Do you want to see the love of God in your own life and in the life of others? John's going to show it to you. Just like he flashes up something on this screen here. He said, this is the love of God. What is it, John? That we keep his commandments and his, not, his commandments are not grievous. What do you mean grievous? For those who know that God's not going to command them to do anything that's not designed to lead them to heaven. That even when keeping his commandments hurt, you still keep his commandments. Because his commandments aren't grievous. All you got to do is think of Christ in the garden. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because it wasn't any other way. And when you take that view toward God's authority and his word toward you and how you're to act, it's plain. But look for the mercy of our Lord, verse 21. We must always be looking forward. To Titus, Paul wrote of looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 11 through 13. How many times do you sit down in a week, I want to mention a day, and think about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the deliverance from this present evil world when he comes? And that we are to look for that new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14. We get so caught up in what's going on right here, we can't think someday this is all going to be gone. There won't be any political campaigns. There won't be any governments in Washington or Moscow or anything like that. Everything that pertains specifically to this life and how it functions will be gone forever. We need to think about eternal life and the mercy we enjoy in Christ through faithful obedience to his word. We yearn for that eternal life that's graciously given to us by Christ, Romans 6.23. We're saved not by works of righteousness we have to, which we have done, but according to mercy that we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, Titus 3, 4 through 7. We must be compassionate, 22 and 23. I'm glad people have been compassionate toward me, especially God. And we must be compassionate to save ourselves, for mercy will only be shown to the merciful, James 2, 13. Then the last point, the need for fear. I've seen brethren say there's something wrong with it if we try to motivate people by fear. But Galatians 6.1 says we ought to fear lest we be caught up in the same air of the wicked. And the people Jude addressed, which is all Christians really, should be that concerned when it comes to what they believe and practice and who they fellowship. We need to be motivated to persuade those in danger of being lost, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11, because many of them don't know. I close by reminding you, here are Jude's final exhortations to the beloved. Remember the words spoken before, verses 17 through 18. Build yourselves up in the most holy faith, verse 20. Pray in the Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, verse 21. Look for the mercy of our Lord, verse 21. And be compassionate with fear. Verses 22 and 23. If you haven't obeyed the gospel as we end this sermon for this morning. 
since the days of their salvation, now is accepted time. We don't know whether we'll ever assemble together like this again. If you need to become a Christian, then believe with all your heart Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10.10. And be buried with your Lord in baptism by the authority of the Lord for the remission of your sins, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, verse 12, Acts 2, verse 38. As a child of God, did you need this today? Well, it's been in our Bibles all along for about 2,000 years. The word of God on this has been given because we are the beloved and God wants us to remain faithful. If you've been caught up in a trespass, we beg of you to repent. Pray God for forgiveness as you confess those sins and God will hear and forgive. Thus, if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.